Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you on your faith journey. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com. Hey everybody, it is great to be here. I'm glad that you are here with us today. I am excited to be up on this stage and getting a chance to speak to you, whether you are in one of our campuses or on our iCampus. It, over the last uh, couple of weeks, as I've been preparing and, and thinking about what I was going to say, I started reflecting on the last time that I spoke to the church as a whole. And it's been a while, actually. I look back at it, and I think we were back maybe even as Flandreau Bible Church, back in the uh, Flandreau Elementary School or Flandreau Commons area. I had a chance a couple of times as we were getting started and as we were a portable church to come over and speak with, uh, with the people here while John was on vacation or had other things going on. So it's great to be back up in front of you. I would be lying if I said I wasn't just a little bit nervous, so uh, be patient with me if you would. It's going to be a great Sunday, and I really believe that God has something that he wants to say to each of us. As we get started, I um, just wanted to to take a minute and honor John. We are blessed as the Rescue Church to have a lead pastor who loves us, cares about us, and uh, is available to us. And this week, it's not that he is not available. It's just that we decided that it'd be good once in a while to give him a break from being the guy up front delivering the message. So we're giving him a little bit of a break this Sunday, and I would tell you that that probably adds a little bit to my nervousness when you've got John, a gifted speaker that's in the audience, getting a chance to hear what God has to say through me today. So, so it's, again, just wanted to honor John with that. It's great to have uh, him, and I'm, I'm appreciative for the opportunity that he's giving to let me speak today. All right, well, as we get ready to go into the message today, we're going to be talking from John chapter 17. And uh, there's a lot of great stuff in John chapter 17. When I was getting ready to speak this week, I asked John, what would be the topic? What, what would you like me to cover? And he said, well, you can pick something you'd like, or you can pick something from John 17 as we continue to go through the book of John. I looked at John 17, and there was a ton of content. Uh, I read it over and over again, and then after reading it over and over again, and I started researching just some other uh, input from other pastors, other, other commentators to see what their thoughts were on it. And uh, they agreed. There's a ton of content here. In fact, found one pastor that preached for 20 weeks on the, just this chapter alone. 20 weeks on John chapter 17. So today, sit back, relax. We're going to be here a while. We're going to fit 20 weeks into one Sunday and so it just may take a little bit longer than usual. No, I kid. I don't plan to be any longer than, than usual. But there is a ton of great content here. With that said, let's just jump right into it. I'll read right from John chapter 17. If you are looking for it in your Bible, John is in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the second half of your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, you're welcome to look it up on your phone. I love the YouVersion app. In fact, that's what I took mine out of. You're welcome to use that, or we will have it up on the side screens or in the lower thirds for you to follow along with. All right, John chapter 17 says this. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that he can give glory back to you, for you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one of you. Uh, I'm sorry, he gives eternal life to each one of you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know everything I have is a gift from you, for I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. 
My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they will bring me glory. Now I am departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name, so that they will be united as we are. That's one of the verses we'll be coming back to. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures foretold. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to the world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me. Father, I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such a perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want them, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see the glory you gave me because you love me even before the world began. O righteous Father, The world doesn't know you, but I do, and these disciples you sent me. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this opportunity today to bring this message. I ask right now that wherever we're sitting, wherever we're watching, that God, you would send your spirit to speak to each of us what we need to hear from your word. I ask God that it wouldn't be my words that they would hear, but yours, that you would direct every bit of this this message, that you would convict us where we need to be convicted, that you'd encourage us where we need to be encouraged. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, that was a lot of reading. We're going to focus primarily on three, I'm sorry, four verses this week. But um, as we get started, I want to give you a little background into these verses, into this chapter of John. As you know, we have been reading and preaching through John and the book of John over the past year or more, actually. And uh, in the recent weeks, we've been talking about what happened in the upper room. That was the time where Jesus went up uh, to this upper room with his disciples. They had the chance to... Uh, eat with him, what we call the Last Supper. He washed their feet. He taught them some different lessons. And then now, not to to spoil the rest of the story, but from here we're going to go on to the point where Jesus is betrayed by Judas and uh, he ends up being crucified and rising again. So we're in that time frame. That's kind of where we're at in this story. Now there is a little bit of discussion Maybe debate's the right word, but but I'll say discussion about when this exactly took place. Was it up in the upper room? Was this a prayer that Jesus prayed in the upper room? Or was it a prayer that was probably prayed in the garden that was heard by the disciples? Or, Or was it a prayer that was prayed somewhere in between? We really don't know where this was prayed, but what we do know is the timeline and that this is a prayed Somewhere in that timeline, right before Jesus is about to be betrayed by Judas and then later crucified. We also don't know for sure whether this is Jesus' entire prayer. What we do know is this is the longest prayer that Jesus prayed that is actually recorded for us, that we can look back in the Bible and read. This is the longest one that we can see there. But we don't know if this is the prayer in its entirety. We believe it is. And from what I read, it seems like it most likely is, but that's not definitive. It's not not certain on that. So now you know a little bit of the background anyway on John chapter 17 and this prayer that we're 
or this prayer that I'm preaching from today. And in this, as you heard, Jesus prays for a number of things. Like I said, we're going to focus on chapter uh, on verse 11, and then we're also going to pr- focus on 21 through 23. And that topic is unity and the prayer for unity that Jesus prayed. He talks about being united, united as he and the Father are one. At this point, they're talking about the Trinity. And I'm going to take a minute and give a little bit of an explanation here, but, but that's challenging because Trinity is not a word that's specifically used in the Bible. It's a concept, though, that is there that speaks to the fact that there is God the Father, who, is we, who we typically refer to as God. There is God the Son, which is Jesus. And there's God the Holy Spirit, and who does the convicting of sin in our lives. So there's, there's those different things, and the Spirit does obviously much more than that. But that's the concept of him saying that he, as he and the Father are one, they're united. Now, I've heard different examples as a kid, and as I've gotten older, trying to, to explain this concept of the Holy Spirit. I don't know that any of them truly, truly explain it uh, in, in uh, the best way, but it may help you grasp the concept. So I'm going to share a couple that I've heard. One of them is water. Water exists in three different types. You have your water as a, a vapor, as steam. You have water as a liquid, which water. And then you have it as a solid. You have ice. So there's water in three phases. All of those are water. They're all water. They're just water in different types. Uh, and I've heard it, the, the Trinity, God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit referred to that way. Another one, and again, not, not sure that this does it any justice as well, but that's a, the example of an egg and how an egg has the shell, the egg white, and the yolk, but all of them make up one egg. Again, not sure if those completely um, clearly explain it, but hopefully it helps you identify and, and at least some, come to some grasp on the concept of the unity of the Trinity, of the unity of God as a whole. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He says that he and the Father are one. In John 10.30, he also refers to that. Uh, that's another time where he refers to the Trinity and again says that as I and the Father are one. You can look that one up as well. Okay, now let's look at what Jesus specifically said. He said that the world may know that you, that God, sent me. And the me is Jesus. That, and then he says in verse 23, he says, he also wants us to know that you, God, love them. So here's my main point. If you've got the note sheets, I'd invite you to pull them out, jot some things down. You can doodle a little bit if that helps you pass the time. Um, But jot this down, and this is our main point, and it's in two parts. If we are the church, he expects us to be, people will know who Jesus is, and they will know that they are loved by God. I'll repeat that. If we are the church he expects us to be, people will know who Jesus is, and they will know that they are loved by God. So that's where I'm going to start today and ask this question. Do people around us, does the world around us, see a united church? And I'm not talking specifically about the rescue church. I'm talking about Christians as a whole. Do they see a united, unified church? I'd have to argue... Unfortunately, that at times the answer is no, that, that they truly do not see that united church that Jesus intended us to see and intended for those around us to see that, so that they would see him, that, so that they would see how much he, they are loved. So I'm going to look back a little bit here, and, and I started thinking about this as I, was, as I was processing unity and what that's looked like. And I've got an example in the not-too-distant uh, distant past here at the Rescue Church where I believe people have been able to see unity. If you remember, and if you've been a part of the Rescue Church for a length of time, a little over a year ago, we started talking about uh, what was going to happen in Gerritsen. It, John and I had had a conversation, actually multiple conversations, with Tyler, 
who was our campus pastor there. And Tyler was really starting to feel God stirring him to be a lead pastor, to be the pastor casting the vision and, and leading that group in an even bigger way than he already was as a campus pastor. And Garrison was a campus that, that we had planted. Tyler had taken the lead with it. He had done much of the work with it. Uh, and we were thrilled to have him. And we recognized that there was a calling that God had on his life to be a lead pastor. So as we talked about it, prayed about it, as we discussed it with leadership, as we discussed it with Tyler, we decided it was the time to move forward. And over the next several months, we took steps to see, to meet with people, to explain what was happening, and that it was healthy, that we were launching an independent church in Garrison, South Dakota, under the leadership of Tyler Ramsby, and that we believed that that's where God was leading and what he would have us to do. The easy thing would have been to say, no, you're part of the camp, you're a campus, you're part of us, we're going to hold you tight, we're not going to move forward. But what we believe God was calling us to do is move forward united with a similar idea and the same idea that Tyler wants to reach that community. He wants to see that that local church reaches that community. And we want to see that as we're in these communities that we're in, that we're impacting them so that people know Jesus, they grow in their faith, and go serve others. So that was a situation where I believe you could see unity as the way we move forward. In fact, there was a lot of compliments and comments about how united we were as we move forward. Some people told us, though, that that, that was something new to them, that what they had seen in the churches they'd been a part of in the past was that there would be leaders in the church or somebody in the church who would maybe stir up a group and instead of it being a, a unified, hey, we're going to go advance the kingdom, it was we're going to split off with our own agenda and we're going to leave this church. And instead of having unity, we had disunity, we had division. And that's what some people had seen and that's what some people commented to us. And truly, as I was thinking about this, I can think of three examples very quickly where this is what happened, where there was that church split that happened in an unhealthy way, where there wasn't that unity. So uh, I guess that would give an example of a, a local thing that I've seen where we have experienced some unity. Now I want to go bigger, though. I want to look at the church as a whole, whether you're in South Dakota or if you're on the East Coast or the West Coast or the South or in Jamaica with our D-Side campus, and I want to think bigger. And so as I thought bigger, I, I came to this question. I thought, why is it that the church, specifically the church in America, is considered one of the most segregated groups in America? Why is the church so segregated? I look back at a quote, and this has been more than 50 years ago, from Martin Luther King Jr. And his comment was, or his quote was, the most segregated hour of Christian America is 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. At that point, it was believed that there was about 96% of churches were primarily one race, one group, um, or one, one type of, of people, if you will. And so we can look, go, okay, that was then. A lot's changed. A lot's happened. Surely we're much better. And that's what I would have hoped. But what we find is actually, and it was recently published in Christianity Today, that today it's 86%. So while that is an improvement, we've got a long way to go, church. We've got a long way to go before we are truly unified as a group. And... and the challenge with that is, is to look at it and go, why don't we match our communities? Why is it that, that we can find one group of people that, that kind of connect, but they don't invite other people that aren't the same as them? Why is there that segregation in our churches where we know that God created each of us in a unique way to love each other, and, and yet at the same point, we don't always see that on Sundays in our churches? And this isn't just, just to, to the, the racial side of things. I would say you could look at socioeconomics, and, and you could see that too. I've heard stories, not even stories, I've heard from people as I've talked, well, that's the church that people with money go to, or that's the church that the power players in town go to, 
or that's the church that this group goes to, or that group goes to. Church, we are segregated, and I pray and hope that that's not the case here at the Rescue Church. I pray and hope that we reflect our communities that we're in, whether it's Flandreau, whether it's Coleman, whether it's going into Brookings, whether it's in Deeside, Jamaica, or Peoria, Illinois. I hope we reflect the makeup of our communities. But we really need to be clear and need to be sure that we're looking at that, that we are a unified church and that we're not splitting up, but that instead we are together loving each other as Christ loves us. All right, that's something I get passionate about, and honestly, I could go on and on about that, but I'm not going to. I'm going to move on to something else that's even more exciting, which is politics. And I know there's certain things that you're not supposed to talk about, politics being one of them. I'm going to jump right into this and, um, and go there. So if you have not had your head in the sand, you know that politics right now at least specifically in this country, are extremely divisive. You can go on social media and you can hear one group saying one thing, another saying another thing. And, and I'd love to say that that's just an American problem and that it's just a problem in the American church, not in the churches around the world. But I think I'd be wrong because I've been in Jamaica uh, and I've been privileged to spend a decent amount of time there and I've been there at times following an election or an election period when there's been mandatory and forced curfews because of the concerns of what's going to happen when those results come out. And if they're concerned what's going to happen when the results come out, it's probably not because they're expecting a big party. That's just what I'm thinking. Um, but there's probably some division there. And here in, J in the U.S., our politics affect what happens in Jamaica. And... I can tell you that I've had conversations over there where there's probably Jamaicans that know more about what's going on in our political uh, atmosphere here in this country than what some of us know. So I know that it's an issue, and I know that it can be divisive. Has anybody been on social media? If you have been on Facebook or Twitter or probably any other form of social media, you have seen the divisiveness of politics. If you have watched the news, you've heard about stuff that's been in the news this past week about NATO and all that's going on, went on over there with the summits. You've seen the, the things going on with Russia and the U.S. and the conversations happening there. And you know that there's two different sides that are coming out of all that, at least two different sides. And so it's an issue. Now, if it was an issue outside of the church, and we could say, yeah, but as a church, we're loving, we're caring, we're a place where people can go and connect and know that it's a safe place. That might be one thing, but it's not just that. I, uh, I am always intrigued. I, I follow a lot of Christian leaders, whether it's in church or business, and I keep track of them, whether it's in articles or, or social media or whatever it might be. And the real reality is we have people on multiple sides of everything. We have Christians, people who I believe love Jesus and are leading organizations that they are trying to point people to Christ. And yet as they're leading uh, their stand and what they're saying from a political side of things and some of the things they're being vocal about is completely opposing to what another group of people is speaking about. There's people that are saying, I can't believe you would vote for or support this person. How can a Christian do that because of this, this, and this? They may even list Bible verses to support their point of view. Then we can go to the other side, and you've got the same exact thing. We're not being different. We're not being set apart. We have politics that are dividing us as a church. So it caused me to reflect on something here in America, and I thought back to Moses as he brought the children of Israel out across the Red Sea to end up in the desert. He's up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. And I know I just blew through that story, but he gets there, he's called up onto this mountain, and he's supposed to talk with God. And while he's up there talking to God, the children of Israel are building this idol, this golden calf, because they are saying, we don't know where he's gone. He may have left us. We need something that we can pray to. And they call on their leaders to create this golden calf that they're going to worship and that they're going to go to. Church, 
my fear in some of our lives is that we have made either a donkey or an elephant that same idol in our lives, where we expect that politics is going to be the hope of the world. We expect that politics is what's going to be able to change things. That's where needs are going to be met, is politics. It's politics. I want to tell you that the hope of the world is found in Jesus, and people should see that through his church, through his bride. But do they? Are we united? Do they see that? All right. Um, I could go on, but I won't for the sake of time. I'll move on to the next thing. What about churches fighting against churches? What about Christians fighting against Christians? And, and what that looks like. When we get to heaven, we are going to see people from a variety of churches, church denominations, church backgrounds, church styles of worship. We're going to see a ton of us there from a variety of different, different places and different backgrounds in the church as a whole. We need to be careful about being so critical of other churches and critical of other Christians. Now, let me be clear on what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that we don't need to call sin, sin. We do need to call sin, sin. And I hope and pray that we as the Rescue Church never stop doing that. But what I'm talking about is when there is a church or people across the street, figuratively, literally, uh, in our communities that is preaching Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, rose again, and that he is the only way to heaven, and yet we're bad-mouthing them instead of celebrating the fact that they're pointing people to, the, to Christ, to him as the Savior of the world, we're missing something. We are truly missing something when we go down that road. We need to stop talking about how other churches do this wrong or that wrong. Let's instead talk about what the Bible says. Let's instead preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let's focus on that. As we look back on the, the teachings that we've gone through in the book of John, we can go back into John 15, I believe it is, where we found out that Jesus is the vine and we as Christians are the branches. So if someone goes to a different church or has slightly different beliefs uh, on some ancillary issues, but yet they love Jesus, they put their faith in him as their savior, they are in the same vine we are. They are part of the same church we are. So let's be careful not to be tearing each other down. Let's not be doing that. We can truly speak the truth without speaking negatively of someone else. We can speak about what we believe without condemning what somebody else said. We can speak the truth in love. So then, let's, go, let's, let's bring this back home as we start to get towards the action steps here. Let's bring this back home and say, what about here at the Rescue Church? Do we have disunity here at the Rescue Church? Are we united as a whole? one church under one vision that meets in multiple locations? Are we all united under that same vision? Or are we, or are we at some bickering back and forth? Do we have campuses bickering against another campus? Do we have individuals in that campus speaking against each other? Look at yourself. It's really always easy to point a finger at somebody else, but let's look at ourselves. Have I been saying something negative about somebody else here in the Rescue Church? Have I been passive-aggressive on social media towards somebody else at the Rescue Church? Have I been passive-aggressive in that conversation that I've had with this other person here at the Rescue Church or in my campus? I would challenge you, truly look at yourself and, and consider whether you are working towards unity, whether you are working towards that oneness that Jesus talks about, as he and the Father are one. They are connected. They are united. As they are one, are you are we united? Are we, <coughs> excuse me, are we all connected? Are we united or are we divided? Are we being divisive? Where do we stand? And do people around us see that unity in us? In 
John 17, 23, one of the verses that we talked about, Jesus said that they may experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and the world will know that you love them as much as you love me. Do our communities know today that Jesus loves them? And do they know that because of how united the church as a rescue church is and the church in our communities is? Do they know that? All right, let's get to some action steps and uh, how we can do something practical with this because that can all sound great, but how does that apply to your life? How does it apply to my life? First, let's talk about what we can do to promote racial unity. I've got a couple challenges for you there. One of them would be take the time to talk to someone from a different ethnic or racial background. And don't be weird about it. This isn't an interview. It's called just talking. It's called being a friend. Take the chance to get to know somebody. For some of us, that's easier as extroverts. We love getting to know people. We love talking to people. For some of you, maybe as introverts, it's a little harder. So I realize that that could be a bigger challenge to some of us than others. But that's one way you can do it. Another way is to read. I am a big fan of reading. You can learn a lot from a book. And uh, if you are someone that says, well, I have a hard time reading because um, of this, that, or the other reason, or I just hate doing it, look at audiobooks. Look at something like Audible or some other form of audiobook so that you can get a chance to listen to it and hear from that. I'll give you three recommendations of books. And again, these are not from Christian authors, uh, two of them. They're is stuff in there that I probably wouldn't agree with from where I stand and how I understand the world, but it helps give us a perspective how other people could see things. One of them is a book called Under Our Skin by Benjamin Watson. Benjamin Watson has done amazing things in the NFL, but he is even known more for his love of people and the things he does in the community. But he gives a perspective uh, from where he came from as a black man in the United States and how he grew up and what things looked like there. There's a book called The New Jim Crow. That's by Michelle Alexander. Uh, that's, that's talking about different races and how uh, our legal system affects them. And I don't say this to be at all political. It's just to give you a perspective, to see things from a different point of view um, and to, to get a chance to learn a little bit. Another one, and you may have heard John mention this in the past, it's called Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. Again, that's Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. And that's one that talks about, uh, I believe he was a young Irish man um, born and raised in uh, Kentucky. Um, he calls himself, as you can imagine, a hillbilly. Um, obviously, the title might give that away. But he gives some perspective on what it was like to grow up in that and how hard it was to, to accomplish some things and to break some stereotypes. And, and so he gives some perspective into what his life was like. There's plenty of other books that can give you perspective from a variety of different standpoints. I would just challenge you, that's one way you could do it. All right, so that's what we can do to, do, to look at some of uh, our political, or I'm sorry, our, our racial and um, ethnic diversity and how are we going to increase some unity there. What about political unity? What are some things we can do there? Uh, one of them, have a conversation where you truly listen to learn and understand someone's point of view. Don't listen to just give an answer. Listen so that you can hear what someone else's point of view is. That doesn't mean you have to agree with it. I'm not saying just because you listen to what they say that you agree with what they say. I'm saying you get a chance to learn from their point of view. Stop posting your political opinions all over social media. When was the last time somebody said, oh, that person says that I should have voted for this person because of this. Man, I was wrong. I am completely switching my point of view. I don't know of anybody that has ever made that drastic a change based on social media. In fact, what it probably does is causes them to hit that unfollow button because they get sick of hearing your rants on Facebook or on Twitter or wherever else it may be. So stop. Stop posting all that on social media. That doesn't mean that you can't have a political view, but I'm saying stop. It, don't let it be divisive. Stop posting all that on your social media. 
Read something from someone with a different political belief than you, from a different viewpoint. Learn to understand why other people believe what they believe. Again, it doesn't mean you're going to change. I'm not even telling you you should change. I'm saying know what they're coming from. Know what they're seeing. Know why they may believe, may believe what they believe and why they think what they think. You can also have a conversation with somebody intentionally with a different point of view. Again, not for the sake of argument, for the sake of listening and learning. That's something else that you could do there. And then as a side note, if you truly want to affect change, you're not doing it by posting it on social media. Get involved. Do something. If there is a cause that you believe in that it is in line with the Bible and in line with God's Word, then get involved. Be that person that doesn't just talk about it, but actually acts on it. Let people see that you believe so much in this that you're willing to do something about it. You'll actually learn a lot more if you take the time to do something about it too because you'll see it from inside and working with it. Maybe, maybe there's somebody here or online or in one of our campuses here that needs to run for political office. We need people who love Jesus that serve, whether it's locally, at a state level, at a federal level, or whatever it might be, we need Christians serving. We need people who love Jesus and who look to the Bible as truth to be people that are serving in our communities, in our states, and in our nations, whether it's here or Jamaica or anywhere else in the world. We need Christians involved. And what, are, what about unity at the Rescue Church? On your note sheet, I think I, I put this on there, but one of them is the four rules of effective communication. We talk about those as we run through uh, our Next Step class. John's mentioned them in numerous sermons, but I'm going to go through them just briefly right here. Like I said, I believe they're on your note sheets. One is be honest. Two is keep current. If you've got an issue that you need to address, stop stuffing it and go talk to the person about it. Keep current. Attack the problem, not the person. So often we put someone's face with a problem when really the problem isn't that person. It's some other issue. Attack the problem, not the person. And be quick to forgive. Forgiving doesn't necessarily mean that you're saying that there was nothing wrong with what they did. Forgiveness is, is extending that, that grace to say, hey, I'm not going to be holding it against you. So those are, those are four things that, that you can do. You can also support each other. If we look at Galatians 6.2, it tells us that we're supposed to share each other's burdens. You got someone that needs a phone call? Pick up the phone and call them. Shoot them a text. See how they're doing. Maybe they need a meal. Maybe they need you to invite them to come over and sit on your couch with you. Maybe you need to play a game at your table. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's dinner. I don't know. But carry each other's burdens. Know that when they're going through people, going through tough times, that it helps to have someone there that cares about them and loves them. And at the same time, rejoice with those who rejoice. Celebrate. When something good has happened in someone's life, congratulate them. Send them a message. Uh, send them a card. The, I, I know in a world of electronic media, it's easy just to send that electronic stuff, but you can actually still handwrite notes and throw them in the mail to somebody. That's another way you can do that. That's another way you can be unified, and that's something that you can do there. Uh, get together. Uh, it, I kind of mentioned that already. i uh, been a part of churches where maybe there was a young a group of young couples or college age, and uh, they met for volleyball every Sunday. There was another group that they, I can't remember what they called themselves. It was seniors something, and it was, I don't even know how they classified what seniors was, but it was a group of seniors that every Sunday after church would go out to eat at a different place, and uh, they just knew that if there was somebody new that they thought fell in even close to their senior group and it, uh, showed up at their campus or their church, they would invite them to meet them for lunch. And there was just a group of them that got together. I know here at the Rescue Church, we've got some groups that meet together as well. And they do different things, whether it's serving at the banquet or serving in a community, or maybe it's just sitting for Bible study, whatever it might be. I know that there's some of that that goes on. But those are just a few examples 
the list is endless of what you could do to connect with other people here at the Rescue Church. And to be united, you have to be together. So as Hebrews 10.25 says, it says, let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now as the day of his return is drawing near. Don't stop showing up to church. Don't stop connecting. We need you, and you need us. We need each other to be united. So those are some real practical steps that those of us who have taken that step of faith and have called Jesus our Savior and Lord, those are some things that we can do. Some of those would apply to others of you who maybe haven't made that decision. Maybe you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus yet. And some of those are just practical things that could apply, things that you could do. But really, those things were directed to the church as a whole, to Christians as a whole. Now I want to speak to anybody here, online or in our campuses, that doesn't have that relationship with Jesus. I pray that somehow, through something that's been said today, that the Holy Spirit would be working in your life. That you would, would be experiencing that conviction and realizing that need for Him as your Savior. But maybe you're not quite at that point. I've got some action steps for you as well. One is, pray that Jesus would make Himself known to you this week. I've encouraged other people to do this, and He does. He will show up. He will make himself known to you. If you truly seek him, you will find him. He tells us that, and he is faithful, and he does. Two, I would say pick up a book or a resource that gives an evidence, maybe even outside of the Bible, that supports the Bible. So it's easy for, for me to say, well, the Bible says this or the Bible says that. You may have questions that go, well, that's great. Why do you always use the Bible to prove itself? So I'm telling you, look at some other resource. There's a book out there that I have read, I've gone through with other people, called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. And he deals with some of the evidences out there that prove that Jesus is who he says he is and that the Bible can be trusted as a reliable source of information, as a reliable book, a reliable document. So that's another book that you could read. Again, Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. There's also one that's called I Do Not Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. That's by Frank Turek. Again, it's the same thing. It'll help you see things outside of just the Bible to prove that Jesus is real, that Jesus is God, and that he wants a relationship with you. So those are, those are two books you could look at. You could contact one of our pastors. You could contact John. You can contact me. You can contact one of our pastors. I would encourage you Contact us. Ask the questions. We would be more than happy to walk through that with you and uh, walk through this, this step of faith with you and answer some of your questions. Ask one of your campus pastors. If you're not um, here, ask a campus director. Uh, hit me up on social media. I would love to have that conversation. Heck, get me on a text message. I will text back and forth with you what it means to have a real relationship with Jesus. I'd be happy to do that. It would be an honor. To do that. Or if one of those three things aren't it, maybe it's that right now today you know that you need to, to trust Christ as your Savior. You know that today is the day that you need to repent. Today is the day that you need to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. You need to admit that you are a sinner and that the only way that you can have a relationship with Jesus is because of his death on the cross his burial, and then his resurrection to take on the forgiveness of your sins. You know that that's the only way you can be united with the church and that you can be united with God. You know that that's what you need to do. I would challenge you this morning, even right now where you sit, take the time to do that. There are connection cards in the seats in front of you. You can make a note on that and hand it to one of us. Hand it to somebody with a name badge in your campus. Just hand it to somebody. We would be happy to follow up with you. Maybe it's even one of these other things that we've talked about. That's a great way for you to connect with us. We want to connect with you. Message us on social media. If you are online, hit the prayer button on the iCampus. Comment 
in the Facebook comment sections. Message us on Facebook. We want to know. We want to celebrate with you. We want to walk through that with you. So if today is your day of repentance, if today is the day, I would challenge you right now, right where you're at, take the time, acknowledge that you need a Savior, acknowledge that you're a sinner, and put your faith in Him today. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the privilege of speaking today. I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the example you give us of what it means to be united. I thank you that, that our faith and our relationship with you is not just a spiritual thing, but a practical thing as well that can affect our everyday lives. God, I pray right now that if there is anybody anywhere in the sound of my voice that needs to get something right with another Christian, that they would do that, that you would bring that thing to their mind now, that they would be able to keep current and that they would be able to attack the problem, that they would be able to address those issues. Whether it's with somebody in the church, here locally, or outside of the church, another Christian from somewhere else. God, help us to reflect who you are. And today, if there's anybody in the sound of my voice who doesn't have a relationship with you, God, I ask that you'd convict. I ask that you would work in their heart and their lives, that the Holy Spirit would stir in them that desire for a relationship with you. I know right now that there is probably, uh, that there is a battle going on for somebody's life or lives here at the Rescue Church where Satan and his demons do not want to let go. God, I ask that you would come up against that, that you would free them from any of that bondage, and that God, right now, they would know that they need you and that they would take that step of faith in you. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the chance to worship you in this message, in our singing, in our giving today. As we go from here, I ask God that you would would do amazing things in our lives this week as we live as a unified church. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to the Rescue Church Past Messages. To hear our messages live, head to one of our physical campuses or check out our iCampus at therescuechurch.tv every Sunday at 10 a.m.